Kevin, if I could do a couple quick process things really quickly before you move on is I want to give you all an example and could have done this earlier, but agriculture is a big concern here in the county. And I won't say what I can't say right now what the impacts on, on of this pipeline project would be to agriculture in this county, but I'll give you an example of another county somewhere else. You know, the thought the, the issue of, of depth obviously comes up. So if the pipeline is too shallow and plays 36 inches. It's going to affect you know people's ability to till. That, that's pretty straightforward. The gentleman raised the subsoil issue. It, it, if you put up subsoil on top, you know you y'all spent years getting your soil just right, the grade just right, treated it, you worked with it. You've got that six, seven, ten inches, twelve inches, you know even two feet of soil work just the way you want, you like it, the way it works and produces for you. That's not put back the, the way it was. You're going to have a the loss, loss of crop, a reduction yield. Then when that, that pipeline, that soil is placed on the side to put the pipeline in, it better be there when you get back. If, you know, if it rains and that stuff washes out, then you're out of topsoil and it goes somewhere else. Those are the kinds of things that you need to have silt fence in place for so it doesn't wash away. It needs to be stacked a certain way. There's a lot of things that can happen you know, to agricultural uh, areas you know, when a pipeline project comes through. These are issues that we deal with every day across the country. Issues in Pennsylvania are going to be different than issues in, in Georgia, and that's what we want to learn to find out the, the, the site-specific stuff. The center pivot irrigation, they don't do that up north. So that's why we're down here getting smart about it and learning and making sure that, again, that goes to the depth issue. So there's a lot of things that are covered in this environmental impact statement. And somebody pointed out later earlier about recommendations and where these, these effects occur. In this particular EIS, the commission made 42 recommendations. In other EISs, I've seen it as high as 147 recommendations. So there's a lot of things that we do do. And the measures to protect agricultural lands or to you know, minimize the impacts to them, because if a pipeline comes through, it's going to impact it. I don't think anybody will tell you there will be no impact. I'm not going to tell you there will be no impact. The question is, how much of an impact would it be? If the issue is to minimize that impact, that's what we describe in here, the measures in terms of how that subsoil will be separated from the topsoil so they don't mix together. What, what the distance of the uh, silt fence will be so that stuff doesn't run away. All those details are not environmental impact statements. So just to give you a little bit more specific examples about uh, our environmental review, that, that kind of detail and that information is in there. Kevin, I, I just wanted to add a little bit more about the process to people. And I'd be happy to talk very specifics with folks after the meeting uh, about certain issues and, and certain ways that we've, we've treated them on other projects. Thanks, I think that helps kind of clear up a little bit. So with that, um, additional comments? I have some. Yes, ma'am. Come on, please. In all three of these meetings, I haven't heard anyone express this, that these companies, these corporations come in, I know through eminent domain, which used to be a useful tool for our communities. But now they come in, and then we're left with it. So why, John, can they not rent or lease our property as long as we're there? Why do we get this one-time recompense, and then they're gone? And like everybody says, we have to maintain it. And like I said before, when we had an extension put in with South or Southern Natural Gas in 93 of April, we are still trying to get Bermuda grass to grow on that knoll up there. And we put fertilizer and lime tremendously on that field. Sandy loam is hard to grow things. And good agricultural dirt is hard to come by. But regarding these corporations and things, if they're going to do with this gas for Florida, that's one thing. But I have a feeling the future is going to bring other issues for them with the gas. And they'll make tons of money, and then they, we're left to pay property tax, look after the property, as we always do, because it's our property, I assume. But leasing, we're in a different area than what we were in 1955, 50, whenever the other pipeline came in. Things are different, and we are burdened. It doesn't matter if you're urban, it doesn't matter if you're agricultural, but you're severely burdened after the corporations take and run. They never come back. Unless you need somebody to dig a water line or a irrigation like they've been talking about. 
And again, I sincerely hope that you will really take a large look at our area. We're different. Every part of the country is different. But we are unique, as everybody is. This is our livelihood and has been for generations. So I just sincerely ask all of you to please, please, don't put this pipeline through here. I don't think we'll ever recover. I know not in my lifetime, probably not my children or grandchildren's lifetime. And I appreciate your time and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Uh, anyone else?